Welcome everyone, today in Rich and Spiritual, presents My Search for Truth, Volume Second by Henry Thomas Hamblin. Chapter 1, On Trying To Live a Life of Faith There may be said to be three stages in the life of man. The first ranges from childhood to about 23 years of age, the second, from about 23 to about 45 years and the third, from about 45 years to old age. In the first stage we sow seed, and do very little reaping, in the second, we reap some of the fruits which we have sown in the first stage, at the same time sowing more seed which will be reaped in the next stage. In the third and last stage we reap the fruits of what we have sown in our two former stages, we also consolidate what we have learned through life's experience, and build something enduring which will live after us. In the first stage of my own life I seem to have but one compelling idea, and that was to get out of the rut of circumstance and thus escape from irksome poverty. In the second, this desire to overcome poverty was intensified. At last I achieved my ambition, but strange to say, when I found myself out of the rut and, with the ball at my feet, with nothing to prevent me from becoming as rich as I liked, I developed a strong dislike for the kind of life which the rich and well-to-do live. The consequence was that instead of wanting to go forward to greater success, I longed with all the strength of my soul to be able to get out of it, and retire to a simpler way of life. This, of course, was even more difficult than climbing out of the rut in which I was born. All my life I had been striving to get on in life and this had produced a momentum towards worldly success and outward achievement. It would have been easy to have continued that kind of life, there would have been no obstacles to overcome, for they had already been mastered. The whole current of my life flowed in one direction, and it was easy to follow. But when it came to getting out of this current, it was indeed a different story. Before going on to consider my third stage, it may not be out of place to emphasize that success in life is really an attitude of mind. If I had been told this in my young and struggling days I should have found it hard to believe, yet nobody did tell me and I had to find it out for myself. After tremendous struggles, mostly unnecessary, we at last managed to get our life flowing in an upward direction, and when once this has been achieved, material success is almost as easy as falling off a log. To continue being successful is then simply following the line of least resistance. To try to change one's life at that point is indeed one of the greatest and most difficult tasks possible. Many of us do not understand the law of momentum. We do not understand that if we keep our mind fixed upon the achievement of a certain aim, we build up a sort of Frankenstein monster which becomes our slave master. That was what I began to discover, but fortunately I was able to escape before it was too late. I found that, whereas in the early stages success appeared to be under my control, in its later stages success threatened to control both me and my life, and also to dictate to me as to what I should do or what I should not do. How to get out of my bonds was indeed a problem. To the reader it may seem strange that there should be so many difficulties, but they were as numerous as the devils which afflicted the man who dwelt in the tombs and whose name was Legion. There were wheels within wheels, problems connected with the business and problems connected with my family. Also there were the inner and invisible forces, the most powerful opposition of all. The conflict was so intense that at last I fell ill. There was nothing organically wrong with me, my illness was purely psychological, due to the conflict between my strong desire to live a different life and the chains which held me to the business which was fast becoming my taskmaster. Ultimately, as the reader already knows, I did escape, but only just in time. I feel quite sure now that if I had not acted promptly, I should have been lost as others have been lost. Thus it was that I entered the third and last stage of my life. Having resigned from my business activities, I began writing and publishing, as described in a previous chapter. 
About this time I wrote two courses of lessons and for these I charged very modest fees, yet this made me uneasy, very uneasy. How could I, though, carry on without any income? George Muller, I recalled, refused to take a salary and also abolished collections, but he put up boxes in which the congregation were expected to place their contributions. He also taught his people the duty of giving, and told them in his sermons of the blessings which come to those who give to the Lord willingly, joyfully and systematically. In the metaphysical world, however, it was quite a different story. Those who wanted help had to pay for it. One good man advertised that he was willing to pray, give treatments, for anyone at five shillings, a dollar, a time, or a guinea a week, five dollars, whilst a large organization charged two guineas, ten dollars, per week and had a number of salaried practitioners who faithfully attended to the various cases which were passed on to them each week. Each practitioner had about twenty cases on his or her list, and to deal with them all twice daily was as much as he or she could manage. I have known several of these people, both those who were paid by an organization and those who were freelances, and have found them to be charming. They were poor, self-sacrificing, devoted and most conscientious, but they said that they had to live and that was why charges were made. If they did not charge for their services they would starve, so they said, they worked just as hard as any doctor or psychiatrist and, like them, they had to live. In my case, however, it was even more difficult. I did not do any healing it is true, but anyone who wrote to me received an answer. Most did not even enclose a stamp, but each letter we sent out cost about two shillings, fifty cents, for office expenses, postage and so on, excluding my services which were given free. Further, preparing and issuing courses of lessons was an expensive matter. It was easy to sink five hundred or a thousand pounds in one course alone, then after that the necessary students had to be enrolled, wages of helpers paid and postal expenses met. Therefore as the magazine was issued at a substantial loss, and it cost more to print and circulate our books than what we received for them, it followed that my courses of lessons were our only source of income. If I gave up charging fees, I should from all appearances soon be forced to discontinue issuing lessons. There was also another point, an important one, so it seemed to me, which was that people always think more highly of a thing if they have to pay for it, while on the other hand they regard it lightly if it is given to them free. I was in very truth on the horns of a dilemma. What actually happened was that I ceased charging fees, relying upon free will offerings. And at this juncture I was helped by the fact that readers of our magazine began sending of their own free will what they termed, love gifts, to help me with my work. I had thrown out no hints whatsoever, and what they did then, and have done ever since, was undoubtedly due to the influence of the spirit, or to the working of an immutable law of the universe. What life was trying to teach me was that I was to live the life of faith. I had to learn that I was to cease entirely from trying to get, and that all I need worry about was to give to the uttermost, thus emptying the channel for the divine blessing to flow in. Until we do empty the channel by giving ourselves and all that we have, the divine blessing cannot flow freely. And so I found that the more I gave, not thinking of any reward, the more I received. Also life became more harmonious and peaceful. The way of the spirit is harmony and peace. At first, however, it was not easy, far from it. My training was wholly against the faith in giving idea, and all my life my principal idea had been to get as much as possible from life, and give as little as possible to life. And because of this I had suffered much owing to the fact that I had been working against the pattern of my life, Consequently I found it extremely difficult to switch over from getting to giving. Sometimes I made things so difficult through some fresh venture of faith, that I became filled with fears and reduced almost to a state of panic. 
Indeed, I suffered so much that at times my burden seemed almost too grievous for me to bear. Yet each time I was delivered and brought victoriously through, in spite of my weakness and fears. I do not mean that I simply dismissed the fears which were troubling me from my mind, refusing either to face my problems or to think about them. No, I faced them and endeavored to overcome them by a realization of absolute truth, I found that all that I had to do was to overcome my fears and find inward release and peace for if I did that then the threatened disaster would begin to fade away. The difficulty was to find inward peace, but until I succeeded in doing so I suffered very much. I mention all this in order to encourage those who may be faced with similar difficulties, and who may be discouraged by certain books which make everything appear so very easy. There can be nothing more discouraging than to read of people achieving most wonderful results without any trouble at all, simply by using some magic formula. My experience has been that anything worth having in the spiritual field can be won only through searching experience. I continue to make my life more difficult from time to time and feel impelled to do this, because I am only really happy when facing great difficulties. Indeed, as soon as life becomes easy and methodical I become bored, and begin to long for fresh fields to conquer. Thus I embark on fresh ventures of faith. Sometimes I think that I have overdone it, and that I have assumed a burden greater than I can bear but on the other hand, I should not be happy if I were not faced with a task that tested me to the utmost. I have found that the great secret of a truly successful life is always to go forward, to be greatly daring, never to play for safety, never to follow the easy path of least resistance, but to grapple with life's difficulties and seize its opportunities in a spirit of high adventure and with courageous faith. Life yields its highest prizes to the courageous soul who claims them and always goes forward, burning his boats behind him. In other words, we are called upon to live a life of faith in which we dare all, again and again, and in which we may seem to lose all, but never actually do. True success attends those who do and dare, but failure dogs the path of those who count the cost and who try to make life easy and comfortable. At first, my faith must have been very small and feeble, and it was through having my faith tested that it began to grow. I noticed that whenever I held back and played for safety, the result was always disastrous, the easier I tried to make my life, the more difficult it became. Whereas if I went forward, greatly daring, choosing the difficult task, it invariably turned out to be the easier path in the end. I also noticed that if I did not discipline myself, then life would do it for me. I found that many of my difficulties were due to the fact that I did not go forward enough, it became quite plain to me that I must order my life in such a way that it would compel me to work hard and live progressively. Consequently whenever I found that I had overcome one set of difficulties, I would set about creating another lot of practice which I still follow. But what God has done, God can do. As an old hymn has it, his love in times past, forbids me to think he'll leave me at last, in trouble to sink. Recalling God's goodness to us in the past, and his deliverances from pressing troubles and threatened dangers, is of the greatest possible help to us when facing apparent disasters. I have found that the searching experiences which came to me as a result of my ventures of faith not only increased my faith, but also advanced me in the spiritual life. The object of our life here is that we should find God and know Him. In other words, to find what Jesus called the kingdom which really means a state of God consciousness. Yet such experiences were really terrifying to me at the time. As the dreaded day advanced nearer I became almost worn out with the strain of it all. The thoughts would come to me, why did I burn my boats behind me? How I longed for a bolt hole of escape. But there could be no retreating, having ventured all, I must go on. How I prayed and affirmed, even wrestling with God, just as Jacob did, but still there was no response, no sign of deliverance. 
And so the experience would hasten on, every day finding me prostrate before God, for it was only God, the one omnipresent spirit who could deliver me. Then fear would raise her voice. Suppose, after all, you have been mistaken and there is none to deliver? Other people whom you know but who follow worldly methods and never think about God are prosperous and apparently happy, while your position becomes more precarious every day. What is the use of praying, for nothing ever happens, nobody cares, you have thrown away your substance and are too old ever to regain what you have lost. Why continue to attempt a life of faith? It is all foolishness and so much moonshine and self-deception. And so the thing would continue, the position becoming worse every day. Would the tide never turn? Was the tempter right, after all? Was there God who could or would answer prayer? Down, down, down I went until there seemed to be nothing left of, the self, and my only desire was that God should deal with me and my affairs in his own way and at his own time. I could do no more. I had done my best and apparently failed, therefore God alone could extricate me from the alarming position in which I had brought myself. Then at the last minute of the eleventh hour deliverance would come, and then what joy was mine, such as no pen or tongue can describe. At such times waves of joy flowed through me, all fear and strain departed, and I felt perfectly at home in God. For a time, at any rate, I knew that, all was well, a thousand times well, both now and a million years hence. Every experience of this kind, after it had been passed through, found me nearer to God, enjoying a more intimate fellowship than ever I had known before. How I praised and thanked God from the depths of my heart. Now I know that such experiences, through the very anguish which they entail, break down or wear away, the hard shell which encases the ego, or false self, and separates it from God our true center and source. Consequently I did well to make my life difficult, for each experience, although at the time almost too grievous to be born, brought me nearer to God and more deeply into His peace. Things are not what they seem, for what appears at the time to be our greatest hindrance, turns out later to be our greatest aid and advancement. All difficulties if met in the right way are turned into stepping stones to higher things. And so we go from strength to strength and from victory to victory. There is another side to this matter of making life difficult in order to attain. It was only in this way that I could become capable of helping others, for it is only those who have been taught by experience who can help others who have to pass through similar experiences. We all travel the way the saints have trod, indeed, we all have to make the journey of Jesus and must be willing to pass through experiences similar to those through which he passed, but in a minor degree, of course. We are all tested and tried, but never beyond our strength. We may be bent and strained, but God never breaks us, relief always comes just at the right time. This is true of all of us. But those who would help others, and perhaps be looked upon as a teacher, even though it be in but a very humble way, must be prepared for much more searching experiences. The law of sacrifice operates always, and at every level. We can help others only to the extent that we are willing to suffer ourselves. Therefore we have the satisfaction of knowing, when passing through a trying experience, that others will be helped and blessed indirectly through what we are enduring at the time. It is impossible to help others by means of book learning, for passing on what we have read from books carries no conviction whatsoever. But what we have learned through experience may come like a message from heaven itself to those who are ready for it. We speak with conviction only when we have lived through the thing of which we speak. Yes. The law of sacrifice runs through life at all its levels. We cannot raise others up except by stooping down and giving them the helping hand of encouragement, so that they can make the great effort needed to bring them round the corner.
We cannot of course truly help others by making things easier for them. Doing things for people instead of helping them to help themselves, through the exercise of faith, does but weaken them for they at once begin to lean on us, instead of upon God. One concluding word about giving instead of getting. This applies not only to money and substance, but also to such precious things as love, friendship, encouragement and so on. If we truly love our fellows, then we find that love comes back to us from many different quarters. If we become a universal friend and brother, then we find that our world is filled with friends and brothers. Give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet withal, it shall be measured to you again. Luke 6, 38 Chapter 2 I continue my story. God does not permit us to remain on a pedestal of self-satisfaction for long. Whilst in my own case I cannot remember ever being self-satisfied, I knew my weaknesses too well, I think that I must have been satisfied with my own work and the way it was succeeding. I remember the late Miss Bridgman, who founded the rally, calling upon me her second visit. But the first time she came I was in the process of building up the work when it looked as though it would be, touch and go, as to whether I should win through or not. She had come in order to find out what sort of individual I was, for owing to the fact that I buried myself in the country and never appeared in public, some strange tales were spread about me. People could not understand why I shunned publicity, the fact that I did not want to bask in the sunshine of public favor was, to say the least, suspicious. Some said that I was deformed, others that I was a freak, all thought that I had something to hide. Consequently several people came to see me so that they could find out for themselves, and they declared that they were relieved to find that I was a normal sort of chap Miss Bridgman was one of these. She said that she would go back to London, and put an end to all the foolish stories which were being bandied about. The second time she came she seemed to be somewhat disappointed. She said I was too much the successful businessman and that I exuded an atmosphere of success and prosperity. I do not remember what I replied, but I probably said that it was necessary to make a success of anything which we might undertake, and as my work was to help people, the more successful I was the greater the number of people who would be helped. Anyway, although I was not self-satisfied, I was very grateful that my work was being blessed and prospered. But life was not going to leave me in that position of fancied security and satisfaction for long. I was being brought to a place of, nodding, as the old mystics term it. Up to this point I had evolved a system which was successful in my own case and also in those of thousands of others. It helped people to face up to life's difficulties, overcome fear and worry, put their faith in God, become more efficient and healthier and happier, to serve instead of trying to get. This surely was laudable enough teaching, so what could be wrong in being satisfied with it? There was really nothing wrong about it, save that I was putting my trust in a system, instead of surrendering to God and allowing an inner, hidden wisdom to take charge of my life. I had to come to that point where everything which I could do myself, and everything in which I had put my trust, failed me. Hitherto I had made use of God in order to attain my own ends, now I was to learn the difficult lesson of becoming dead unto self and alive unto God, so that his ends might be achieved through me. Having reduced prayer to an exact science which could be used successfully to clear up any situation, I was now to pass through that time of apparent failure and frustration, when God seems to have removed himself from us, and even our prayers are found to be vain and fruitless. I was approaching a great crisis in my life, at the nodding place where we have to lose our life in order to find it. First of all, a great personal trouble began to develop. I felt that I was dealing with a powerful and menacing presence. All my well-proved systems of prayer proved to be of no avail whatever, 
and so the evil thing developed steadily and rapidly. Everything which had hitherto been so successful now failed me, and I was reduced to a condition bordering on despair. One evening as I was sitting feeling burdened with trouble and overwhelmed by a black cloud which threatened to destroy me, God suddenly spoke to me in a verse from an old hymn greatly beloved of my father. Of course I heard no voice, but the Spirit recalled this verse to my memory, and illumined it in such a way as to bring a message to my soul, Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take, the clouds ye so much dread, are big with mercy, and will break in blessing on your head. There may seem to be nothing particularly remarkable about these words, but to me at that moment they meant everything and in a flash I passed from a state of crushing despair to one of comparative peace. Let me try to explain the matter. Ever since the trouble started I had been resisting it, I had looked upon it as an evil thing to be fought against and destroyed. Nothing but evil could come out of it, so I believed, therefore if God did not take the trouble away it would be the end of everything, and nothing would remain but abject despair. But it was too big a thing for me to master. It was one of those things which we have to allow to develop and unfold in its own way. I had got to learn the great lesson of agreeing with my adversary, even as Jesus taught. Then God revealed to me through the simple words of the verse that the cloud which I feared so much, and which I looked upon as an evil thing, was actually full of mercy and that the trouble itself, would descend upon me in the form of a most gracious blessing. This great experience would probably be termed by modern psychologists as a, reorganization of the personality, but which I prefer to call total surrender of ourselves to God and His will concerning us. Sooner or later we discover that life is divine, that is, that God is in every experience and that the divine activity is in every happening. What is needed is that we should submit to the divine guidance, for life is divine, or good, and what is needed is that we shall agree with it and come into correspondence with it. But as I mentioned in the last chapter, the act of surrender has to be repeated many times, this it will be remembered I have found to be true in my own life. At the time that this great experience came to me, I believed wholeheartedly that I really and truly surrendered everything to God, every sinful desire, every weakness, all pride and self-sufficiency, every atom of self. I gave myself utterly and completely and dedicated my life wholly and unreservedly to God, so that I had not a desire of my own at all. As far as I knew at the time, my surrender was genuine, sincere, and absolutely wholehearted. But as time went on, another crisis gradually developed and again I was brought to the nodding place. I found that in spite of the sincerity and apparent completeness of my first surrender, there were still certain areas of my personality which were unredeemed, parts of me into which I would not admit my best friend. Then again I surrendered wholeheartedly and fully, genuinely thinking that it was complete. But after a time another and yet another crisis would come into my life. Verily, the self takes a long time to die. One of the crises was due to a recrudescence of all the old passions and weaknesses of the flesh. Everything came back with redoubled power and I could in truth then sympathize with Saint Paul when his oft-quoted words were wrung from his agonized and tormented soul, the good that I would do, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now the adversary said to me, what is the good of it all? What is the use of your trying any more? Here you are, back again. You cannot escape me. All this holiness business is futile, you cannot keep it up. The revelations from God which you think you had were only hallucinations. It was the same old story, but on an infinitely humbler plane, of he saved others, himself he cannot save. Where now is thy God? I have been told that those who try to teach along the lines of the gospel have to pass through desperate experiences and tests, that is, if their teaching is true. If their teaching is nefarious, or a mixture of the true and nefarious, 
then they will be left alone. But directly they begin to teach the real thing they are marked down as a special target, from every possible angle and at every possible point is an assault made. Also I am told that those who try to teach spiritual truths in order to help others are liable to take upon themselves the trials, troubles, tests, and even diseases of those to whom they minister. Again, whatever he may teach, upon that very thing will the teacher be tested. This was first brought to my notice by a lady who had been a contributor to a now defunct metaphysical magazine. She confessed that everything about which she wrote brought to her a severe testing on the very thing about which she had been writing. The reason is not difficult to see, for it was through meeting such a testing experience that the writer was advanced to that stage of attainment about which she wrote. Most writers on these subjects generally write beyond their present stage of attainment, after which comes the experience which, if it is properly grappled with will advance them to that stage about which they have written. It is much the same with those who use affirmations. They generally affirm something that is at present beyond them. Then they may be surprised to find that an experience comes to them which gives them the opportunity, of proving the truth of that which they have affirmed. They may not like the experience at the time, but when they have passed through it, they realize that they now really know, whereas formerly they only believed. We can only know as the result of experience. It is only when we have passed through an experience and been delivered by God, that we know God as our deliverer, similarly we can only really know God as our healer by being healed, as our source of supply only by trusting God to the last ditch, so to speak. One correspondent once wrote to me that she was trusting God to the last lump of coal. Temptation comes always to try us on our weakest point, there must be something in us which responds to the temptation, otherwise it would not be any temptation to us. But the object of the test is not to drive us down into hell, but rather to bring us to that state of surrender in which we let God in, so completely and utterly, that He can unite us with Himself and make us like unto Himself, so that our weakest point becomes our strongest. But it may be asked, is there no royal road to attainment? Must progress always be made through terrific cataclysmic experiences in which the soul is brought to the very brink of extinction? The answer is that it depends upon the individual. Some are getting near the end of their immense journey, and are willing to make a steep and direct ascent to God, and to go through anything in order to enter into divine union. Such invite tremendous experiences and are quite satisfied to meet them, for each obstacle is a stepping stone to higher things. Others, on the other hand, may not be willing to make the steep and sharp direct ascent to divine union, preferring to go more slowly by an easier and less direct route. These are less heroic and daring than the pioneer type, they prefer to follow rather than to lead and are not prepared to suffer or run risks. Such individuals are what might be called the rank, and file they wait for pioneers to blaze the trail, or even to make a good road for them. They are not prepared to go on alone, neither do they want to scale the heights. Rather, they prefer to follow a winding path up the mountain, a path not so steep or dangerous but which, although it is far longer, yet at last leads to the summit. God has his place and uses for each type. Each one of us is in his right place at the right time. Lest any might think, apropos my own crises, that I am making excuses for myself, let me say at once that I realize that within myself is the cause of everything that comes into my life, and I take full responsibility for all the catastrophes which have come to me. One of their objects has been to teach me humility, for we can make no real progress in the spiritual life without true repentance, humility, and love. I think that I can say that I have done my share of repentance and have tried to love all humanity and to be a universal lover and friend, but I fear that I have failed in humility. Consequently many of the blows which I have received have been necessary, in order to teach me humility. We are all inclined to become proud and self-satisfied, 
and it needs great blows to rid us of these vices. A blow to our pride is one of the most painful experiences through which we have to pass, and as such come through other people, it is a great help if we have learnt the great art of returning love for every wrong done to us. It is pride which makes us want to justify ourselves and to resent false attacks and misrepresentation. There is another great cause of severe trouble arising in the life of the true aspirant, neglect of waiting upon God. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The promise is not given to any others, but only to those who wait upon the Lord. Renewal of strength is conditional upon the regular practice of waiting upon God, therefore if we neglect this we become weakened and are liable to fall in the hour of temptation. We also find ourselves entangled in all sorts of difficulties. Then some great trouble comes which drives us back upon God, we are compelled to seek Him afresh, through much suffering, until at last we find Him and harmony is restored. Quite often I receive letters from people whose story is that, through neglect of waiting upon the Lord, they have fallen into dire trouble and old weaknesses have reasserted themselves. Everything in their life appears to have gone wrong, and there seems to be no way out of their distresses. They would like to get back to the path once more, in fact that is their one great consuming desire, but feel unable to do so. The remedy is, of course, to make a supreme surrender to the Lord. Jesus had to come to it in the garden, Newman came to it when he wrote Lead Kindly Light. All of us have to come to it sooner or later. We come at last to that stage when we lose our life in order to find it, that is, we give up the puny life of the self and separateness, to find in its place the life of God which is our true life. It seems to me that no matter how perfect we may be, we must all come to our nodding place. The classic example is the experience of Jesus. He who went about doing good and who had overcome all temptations and had lived a pure and unselfish life, even he was brought to the limit of his endurance in the Garden of Gethsemane. Even he prayed in his agony, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not as I will, but as thou wilt. In spite of his perfect life and his ministry of love and healing, Jesus was brought to that dark hour of utter surrender to the Father's will, and to the willing acceptance of all that was coming to him. Yes, even he had come to his nodding place. My own experience has been that the life of the Spirit is in sections. During the first we live a life of faith and trust in God, we try to live a godly, righteous, and sober life, and probably succeed most of the time while, if or when we fail, we are truly sorry for our sins and shortcomings. During this period we think that we are doing everything and accomplishing everything which is accomplished, with God's help, of course. We are pleased with our progress, we are thankful that we can help others. We make progress in many directions and learn many lessons through experience. We meditate upon truth, we may even work wonders through faith and prayer and may also become teachers and speakers, preachers and writers. But during the whole of this period, self, is really our center and our master. We may be unaware of it, but our life as we have known it hitherto, has to come to an end, while the, self, which we know, has to die. Ye must be born again. As Jesus also said, we have to be reborn of the Spirit from above. Again Jesus said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. That is the secret, we have to die in order to live, the grain has to die, as a grain, in order that out of it a new life may arise. It is this dying process which is so painful to the self. We want to preserve the self at all costs. But at last we come to the point of utter surrender, and when finally we give up the self, we enter into such joy and peace as we have never known before, and which we did not believe to be possible. When we reach the second stage, we realize that we are not doing everything as we fondly imagined, 
we discover that God is doing it all, and that without Him we can do nothing, and indeed are nothing. God is in everything and the divine activity is in every circumstance and happening. When once we know this we can declare that God is with us in every experience and that therefore only good can come out of it. It is in order that we should reach this second stage that the nodding stage is necessary. We have first to go down before we can be raised up. But the nodding experience can assume many forms. It came as a dark time to the saintly Newman, and as a catastrophic series of experiences to my unsaintly self. But I believe that it was the same experience. It is rather like taking a railway journey. We travel quite a long way, but at last we reach a junction where we have to change into another train and on to another line, if we are ever to reach our right destination. We have to break away from that which hitherto has served our purpose very well. If it had not been of service to us we should not have arrived at the junction, but now it can no longer serve us. We have to break away from it all, and set forth anew. No matter, then, what form the experience may take, the time comes when we give up ourselves and our life entirely into God's hands. Directly we do this we enter into a great peace which is God's own inward peace, such as the divine mind knows and enjoys. Because we have given ourselves up entirely to God we are able to enter into His peace, and we become immersed in it. The great experience through which I had passed had its effect upon my work. As I changed, so also did my teaching change. I had been through the dark valley and had emerged a changed man, dependent upon God for everything. Therefore I was now equipped to help others through the same experience. So from that time on my teaching took on a new note and became more spiritual, less metaphysical and psychological. I could only teach effectively that which I had learnt through experience. This entailed considerable financial loss, for I burned up all the tons of booklets and lessons which had been so laboriously prepared. The fire lasted for days, and with it perished much of my capital. It also entailed a tremendous amount of work, for all the things which I burned had to be replaced by others, all written by myself. This had to be done outside office hours, for at this time my office work was a whole-time job. In addition to writing new courses of lessons, my books also had to be withdrawn from circulation and rewritten. How I survived all this labor without a breakdown seems wonderful to me now. Not only was I overworked, but at the same time I was making unwise and ill-advised experiments with my diet. Also I fasted a lot, equally ill-advised, so that I felt completely exhausted. However the task was at last completed but I could not relax, for with the issuing of the new teaching, came more students, floods of them, it seemed, which meant more work and yet more work. Many expressed their regret at the changes which were made, their objection being that the former teaching helped many thousands, and because of that it should have been continued. They explained that the majority of those who were helped by the former teaching were not ready for the more advanced instruction, neither would they be willing to follow it, even if they were able to understand it. They also pointed out that the former teaching was helpful because it applied to this life and how to make the most of it, overcoming difficulties, rising above obstructions and living a life of service and working in harmony with the laws of life. I was reminded by all this of what happened to Jesus. Many thousands of people flocked after him, and thousands professed to be his disciples. But the majority of them, when they discovered that his teaching really was the gospel of the interior kingdom, and not the founding of an earthly kingdom, went back and walked no longer with him. Consequently, Jesus lost most of his disciples. They were glad to go with him when he fed the multitudes and worked other signs and wonders, but when they learned what real discipleship meant, they preferred to walk another way. I felt that I must follow Jesus in this matter, so I withdrew my teaching, and started all over again. Many left us, but not all, 
whilst others were attracted. These were seeking to become heirs of God, and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, who in their search for truth were prepared to go anywhere the search might lead them. The difference between the new aspect of my teaching and the old was this, the former teaching did not accept the disciplines and what Paul termed the chastenings of life, but overcame them by resistance and by the use of spiritual powers. My new teaching accepts life's disciplines and chastenings, works through them, learns as much as possible from them, and thus turns apparent obstacles and hindrances into stepping stones to higher and better things. The former teaching stressed too much getting on in life, the latter stresses the necessity of giving all to life and leaving God to give the recompense. The difference is a very subtle one, and a great many people have no patience with it. They say that this change from self to God is unnecessary and ask why they cannot go on as they are, but getting better and better, until they become perfect. But Jesus said, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground, and die, it abideth alone. Alas, the teaching of Jesus has been ignored and other things substituted. Of course, I realize that everything is right at the time and in its right place, I can see now that I was being led by the Spirit as much when I turned out elementary teaching as when I promulgated a more advanced teaching. It was the same Spirit leading us on, both teacher and taught. Thousands of people were helped then who could not have been helped by a teaching more advanced. Even now, most of my books are what one might term pre-surrender teaching. But my one desire now is to help aspirants to find God and enter into divine union. Yet on looking back on my life, the thing which stands out probably more prominently than anything else is the wonderful way I have been led to do the right thing, at the right time. In spite of all my foolish mistakes, and wanderings into Bypath Meadow, yet just when I reached the critical point when another step would have ruined me forever, I have been led to strike out on an entirely different path. And this path has always proved to be the only right one for me. This is the story of my own search for ultimate truth. It is in no sense a textbook, neither does it presume to lay down any laws for others. Each seeker must go the way in which the Spirit leads him, yet because he may not yet be ready for the experiences which I describe, he should not be perturbed. Everything will come to pass, in his case, as in mine, just at the right time. All that he has to do is to live a life of trust in God, and deal with each experience of life in a spirit of love and service. He should put the little bit of truth he already knows into practice, and if he does this greater understanding will come to him, not intellectual knowledge, but a real knowing by the soul of things which are quite beyond the greatest intellect. We do not have to worry about our unfoldment at all, for the experiences of everyday life give us just what we need in order to advance us in spiritual understanding. If we make every difficulty a matter of prayer, then every experience brings us nearer to the heart of God. The many irritating incidents which happen during the day may all be resolved into harmony, by turning to God and realizing the divine truth about them. This not only conserves us physically, but also advances us in spiritual understanding. Everything that happens to us is an opportunity to seek our divine source in order to find a harmonious solution. The mistake which we are liable to make is in being satisfied with living a life of faith, in which all difficulties are resolved by turning to God and realizing the truth. But of course we cannot stand still, we cannot remain where we are, in a state of satisfaction, if we try to do so, then a time comes when everything appears to go wrong and all our methods fail us, until at last we can only pray, lead thou me on. In the light of experience, it seems to me now that if I had been willing to be disciplined and chastened, then the changeover would not have been so painful and catastrophic. The path of liberation is not a veil of woe, love accompanies us all the way. Everything is designed to bring us to greater joys than we have ever known before, 
while to experience God's peace is greater bliss than can be described. The greatest human or physical bliss is but a counterfeit, of the real bliss of divine union. Chapter 3 The Overcoming of Grief and Sorrow A passing reference has already been made to the bereavement which befell us, and our family in 1918, and whose immediate impact made us feel that a light had gone from our lives. As all of us must at some time or other experience grief, sorrow, and bereavement, let us consider this matter together, first, the necessity of overcoming the grievous experience, second, the best way of doing so. It is as vitally important that we should overcome our grief, and sorrow as it is that a boy should overcome his disappointment when he fails to pass an examination. If he were to give way to his disappointment he would never try again, and thus would never be able to retrieve his fortunes and make good. If we give way to grief, we lower our own efficiency, we also invite sickness and ill health. In addition, we attract financial loss, poverty and other negative ills. There is an old saying to the effect that, troubles never come singly. This is very true, and the reason this is so is mainly, I think, due to the fact that the first trouble, if given way to, produces a negative condition which attracts other troubles and ills of various kinds. If therefore we overcome our grief and sorrow, we also are protected from many negative ills to which we might otherwise be prone. Or, even if we do have to meet such negative experiences, we are able to do so with a stout heart and a triumphant spirit, instead of falling a victim to them. For the sake of others also, we must overcome. If we give way to grief, we not only become less efficient, we also become a drag upon those around us. They, instead of being inspired by our example, become depressed and weakened by our mourning and sorrow. Instead therefore of being a help to those around us, we become a hindrance. We see around us some lovely examples of those who overcome. I can recall one woman in particular whose face expressed to a remarkable degree a state of inward peace. One could describe the expression of her face only as heavenly, there was no other word which could describe it. And as we looked at her calm face, we realized intuitively that here was one who had been through the fires and who had weathered many a storm yet one who had found God's inward peace, and that it flowed through her like a river. Alas, we also meet those who give way to grief and sorrow. How sad a sight it is to see them. They excite our pity, but they do not inspire us for if they have the opportunity they will pour out their tale of woe. Two extreme cases of this type might be mentioned. The first was that of a man who lost his son. Instead of meeting his trouble like a man and trying to find a certain amount of relief by working extra hard and with increased diligence, he refused to go to work at all. He walked about telling everyone of his bereavement and describing his own sufferings. The end of it was that he lost his job, and thus became a charge on his own family, he also lost the respect of those who knew him. The other case is even more extreme and was told us by Swami Ramdas. Ramdas once met a man who had left his work and also his home, going about from place to place, wailing and weeping loudly. Swami Ramdas told the man to keep on repeating a certain mantram without stopping, this the man did, and then found to his surprise that his grief had gone. Now I know that while it is easy to speak about over, coming grief and sorrow, it is far from being an easy thing to do. Indeed, it is only one who has come through the furnace himself who is able to help others to overcome. Those who do not overcome cannot of course help others, for their idea of comforting those in sorrow is to relate all their own griefs. But this can only make matters worse. In my own case I did not get much help from others. One person said that I should look forward to the resurrection, another was most lovingly sympathetic and took hold of my hand in both of his and called me, his dear brother. I loved him for doing that. 
I also loved the other parson, for I knew that his sympathy was wonderfully deep and true, but neither of them could help me in any definite way. They had nothing to suggest. Consequently as usual I had to find my own way and puzzle things out for myself, which was probably the best way for me, as I have always been inclined to be independent. This brings me to our second point, viz. The way to overcome grief and sorrow. Briefly it can be stated that deliverance is achieved to the extent that we succeed in staying our mind upon God. Some however may exclaim, but how can I cease grieving, when it is as though my heart had been torn out by the roots? The answer is that we do not try to stop ourselves from grieving, for to do so would be I useless. By trying to stop a bad habit or a hurtful practice we do but make it stronger, the only effective way of dealing with a bad habit or a hurtful practice is to cultivate an opposite good habit or practice. Therefore instead of giving way to our grief and sorrow on the one hand, or fighting against it, on the other, we make a deliberate effort to switch the mind over to God and truth. To the extent that we succeed in doing this, do we succeed in overcoming our grief, for we have to do something positive if we are to overcome. Instead of making our bad habit stronger by fighting it, we cut the ground from underneath it by cultivating the most positive habit or practice of all, viz. Staying the mind upon God. Thus we overcome by what is termed, action in inaction. In one sense, we do nothing, yet in another sense, we do something very positive. I have heard some people say, and I also receive letters to the same effect, that they do not know why they fail, because they try so hard to overcome their weakness. Also, some tell me that they fail in spite of the fact that they pray so hard against their weakness. The reason they fail is of course that they do not work according to psychological law. The laws of mind are infallible and unchanging. It has been said that we can overcome nature only by obeying her laws, in the same way we can overcome our weakness only by obeying the laws of mind. This is the secret of all overcoming, not to fight, but to retire into the hidden strength, keeping our mind stayed upon God. How can we do this? In my own case the first thing that I had to discover was that the true, way to meet life's experiences is just the opposite of the natural way. It was after I had discovered this that I noticed, rather to my surprise, that Jesus had taught the same thing. I could then understand why my father and others would not pay any attention to the teaching of Jesus, but said that I must accept certain doctrines instead. They were trying to explain everything by the reasoning of the human mind, and as the teaching of Jesus was the very reverse of this, they would not have anything to do with it. Having been taught certain doctrines instead of the words of Jesus, I knew very little about his teaching. Therefore I had to find things out for myself, then when later I found that what I had discovered had been taught by Jesus, I was greatly encouraged. What I discovered was very simple indeed, so simple and obvious was it that I could not understand why I had not seen it before. All that I discovered was that the way of the Spirit, that is, the heavenly way of dealing with life's experiences, was the exact opposite of the way of the world and that of the human mind. Consequently, as far as ethics were concerned, all that I had to do was to do the exact opposite of what I would naturally want to do. Jesus taught us to agree with our adversary instead of resisting him, we were to go the other mile, and so on. All at once I realized that that was what I was doing, I had learned to do the very opposite of what the natural man would want to do. And so it was with dealing with the problem of grief and sorrow. The natural thing to do when bereaved is to give way to grief and sorrow. We may feel that we want sympathy from others, that we want pity, that we want to show to the world how great our love is, by appearing crushed and stricken. We may want to indulge in self-pity. Instead, however, of behaving in any of these ways, we do the exact opposite. 
the bolder we are, the better. So we start off by praising and blessing God for all his goodness and mercy. That in itself kills self-pity, it also destroys our self-centeredness. Only too often inordinate grief is due to self-centeredness, consequently if we keep on praising and blessing God, our self-centeredness becomes undermined, so that it dies a natural death, as does a plant when it has been deprived of its roots. Also it is an act of faith, for it requires faith to praise God when we are sorely stricken, and unable to understand why it is that we should have been dealt such a fell blow. Is it easy to praise God in such circumstances? No, indeed, it is far from being easy, but it is possible for us to master it, if we make up our mind to do so. At first it is like trying to swim in water that is choked with weeds. If however we persevere, we can actually make a habit of praising and thanking God, so that we feel at a loss if we cease doing so. This method can be applied to any calamity which may come to us. No matter what it may be, if we perseveringly thank and bless the Lord in the face of the trouble, we do the one thing which will ride us through the storm, and bring us into a haven of peace. But I have also found it helpful to thank God for the loved one whom we have lost a while. This requires more courage, for it reminds us of our loss. But we must be brave in this attempt to overcome, we cannot be victorious if we run away. We have to face up to that which we dread. I do not think that any victory can be won merely by trying to forget. It is much better if we face up to things and try to overcome, instead of endeavoring to evade that which is painful. Therefore it is helpful if we have a photograph of our loved one in every room, not in order to remind us of our grief, but in order to remind us to pray. If we pray every time our eye rests upon the photograph it leads not only to victory, but brings great blessedness. Therefore we take the brave course and thank God for the loved one, who has passed into another room of God's many mansions. The first stage of our prayer, then should be, I thank thee for all thy love and goodness. The next stage, I thank thee for mention the name of our loved one. Then this can be followed by, I thank thee for his, her, love and faithfulness. This can be followed by, I thank thee for the years of blessed companionship which we were privileged to enjoy. This is probably the most difficult prayer of all, and it is so, because it reminds us of the fact that this blessed companionship has been seemingly cut short. It is not easy to concentrate upon the years of blessed companionship which we have enjoyed, and to refuse resolutely to admit the thought of our loss into our mind. Of course, we do not fight against the intruding thought at all, but only concentrate on thanking God for the years of blessedness which we have been privileged to enjoy. Finally, we come to the last stage of our prayer, which is, I thank thee because thou art leading him, her, on to higher and better things. Yes, life is ever progressing. The next world is not a stagnant one, the life there must be one of constant progression, a rising to higher and better and more glorious things. Instead of limiting our loved ones by our selfish prayers, we let them go so that they can rise into the divine light and radiance and glory. Then we can add, I thank thee because thou art raising us all to higher and better and more glorious things. It does not matter whether we are still here on this earth plane, or whether we have passed on to the light realms, we are equally in the love and care of God. It is a good plan to master each stage of this prayer before passing on to the next one. Indeed, one stage is about as much as most of us can manage at the time. When the first stage of the prayer by constant and faithful practice has been mastered, the next stage can be added. Thus in addition to saying, I thank thee for all thy love and goodness, we add, I thank thee for mention the name of our loved one. This will not prove at all easy, because it may bring back our sense of loss, and make us feel, empty and raw inside, as one dear sufferer described it. But, again, 
if we face up to it bravely and persevere in using the prayer, we are helped to overcome. The natural tendency is to be tempted to do just the opposite at such a time. But if we follow the way of love and faith, by practicing the prayer, our grief becomes more assuaged. When we have mastered the second stage, we can add the third. We can say, I thank thee for his, her, love and faithfulness, this too will be a difficult addition. To use it may seem like raking over raw wounds, but if we try to use it, we are again helped by the Spirit and given strength and grace sufficient for our task. After this has been mastered, we have next to add what is probably the most difficult stage of all, I thank thee for all the years of loving companionship which by divine grace we have been privileged to enjoy. Having mastered this by persistence and by persevering practice, we are now ready to complete the prayer by adding, I thank thee because thou art leading him, her, to higher and better and more glorious things. And while praying in this way we should try to feel the uplift of these words. When this has been mastered, we can add, I thank thee, because thou art leading us all on to higher and better and more glorious things. While saying these words we realize that there is no separation, neither is there any loss. We are all of us, whether still, here, or already, there, one in the love of God. So now we are ready to pray the complete prayer, which will now run as follows, I thank thee for all thy love and goodness. I thank thee for, and for his, her, love and faithfulness. I thank thee for the years of blessed companionship which we were privileged to enjoy. I thank thee because thou art leading him, her, on to higher and better things. I thank thee because thou art raising us all to higher and better and more glorious things. This complete prayer can only be prayed when we have a little quiet time to ourselves, we cannot use such a long prayer while we are going about our daily work. At such times we must use a shortened version of it. If we are very rushed we can say, I thank thee, which will recall subconsciously some of the prayer itself. When we get a little time to ourselves, we can sit down, close our eyes, and pray the prayer right through. The question may be asked what I mean by praying. Do I mean that we are to kneel down, close our eyes, and fold our hands in the conventional way? No, indeed. What I mean is mental prayer which can be practiced at odd moments. We can lift up our heart to God, the central and interior harmony, while busy about life's duties. If we can steal a moment to ourselves, we can also close our eyes while we connect ourselves up with the divine harmony, and utter our few words of praise and thanksgiving. Of course we must concentrate upon what we are doing. For instance, we should not close our eyes and pray while we are, say, driving a car, but we can pray before we start. We can also maintain a joyous and praiseful state of heart which keeps itself going, subconsciously. All prayer must be fervent if it is to be effective. Therefore when we pray we should do so with all our mind and strength, and we should bless the Lord with, all that is within us. There is an interior central harmony, in which everything is perfect and right. This is the realm which we contact when we pray. Through the practice of prayer, and also perhaps through the anguish of the sorrows which we all have to meet at some time or times during our life, we reach a stage when we can rise into the divine peace and harmony at any moment. We know at once the peace of God, we enter into a state of blissful oneness and unity. Some may protest that what I have been saying is all very I well and that while it may apply to cases of ordinary bereavement, it fails to meet the needs of those whose experience has been of a violent and tragic character. Some, alas, have had a loved one murdered in terrible circumstances. What can those who have had such a terrible experience do? How can they bless and praise the Lord? Frankly, I do not know, but I do know that prayer is the only remedy for every ill. Therefore the worse the experience the more need there is for prayer. 
I have found that the only remedy is prayer in same form, no matter what circumstances I may be in. And so to those who have had to meet such a tragic and terrible experience I would implore them to pray, and to keep on praying, with all their strength. For the final remedy is the staring of the mind upon God, and it is only by prayer that this can be accomplished. It is those who come through the greatest experiences and trials who enter into the greatest joy, and experience the profoundest peace. Those who go about in an atmosphere of peace, and with the light of heaven upon their countenances, these are they who have come through great tribulation. No tongue nor pen can describe the inward joy of one, who has won through great tribulation and bereavement, and who has learnt to praise and rejoice in the face of loss and sorrow. Such joy can never be described, for it is of heaven, although it can be experienced on earth. My closing word is let us all pray without ceasing, for prayer is the remedy for every ill. It is through prayer that the overcoming of grief and sorrow is to be found. Chapter 4 Some Thoughts on the Life to Come it would seem consistent, at this point in my narrative, to consider some thoughts on the life to come, that existence which is ours when our earthly pilgrimage is done. What I have to say will be, as indeed is the case throughout these pages, the fruitage of my own experience, as well as my own convictions. Some writers speak with apparent authority about the next life, but when we come to look into the matter we find that most of their ideas are but a repetition of what somebody else has written. Others too speak with authority based on certain interpretations of scripture, generally somebody else's. My consideration of the subject entirely rules out anything of a psychic nature, for I have neither experienced the trance state, nor heard voices nor been vouchsafed visions. Such being the case, how is it that I am so certain of life beyond the grave? I am certain because I know, that is to say, all my life I have possessed what might be termed a consciousness of immortality. I never could understand those who declare that when they die, it is the end of them. They on their part cannot understand how it is that I know that I am immortal, and that I shall always go on living, not in this material body, but in some other body. As Paul says, spiritual questions can only be spiritually discerned, they cannot be encompassed by the human or, what he termed, the carnal mind. Now although I have had no psychic experiences, yet I have all my life been conscious of an invisible world impinging upon this one which at times has been very near and real to me. For instance, when I was quite young we were once visited by an unusually violent thunderstorm, and everybody was in a panic of fear. I clearly recall sitting down on a chair, when immediately I experienced a delightful feeling of peace and well-being. All fear left me and it seemed, that I was surrounded by invisible heavenly presences, and that I could come to no real harm, no matter what might happen. Consequently I know that there is an invisible world and that it is infinitely good. I know because I am at all times conscious of it. But this does not explain how I know that I am immortal, and that I can never die. When I speak of immortality, I speak of the soul, and not this material body. I believe that the physical body can be transmuted even as was the body of Jesus. In addition to being aware of another world of infinite harmony and friendliness, I am also aware of my own identity. As I have described more completely elsewhere, I one day suddenly awoke to the fact of my true identity, and knew that I, in my true inmost self, am immortal. This was not a mere belief, or intellectual conception, but was a sudden awakening to a realization of the truth of being. It was the real self breaking through the shell of egohood which encased it like the shell of an egg encases the chick and which longs to break through into a wider world. This then is what I know by direct knowing, what follows is what I firmly believe. In my Father's house are many mansions, said Jesus. John 14, 2. 
Paul spoke of a man who was caught up to the third heaven, and others postulate seven planes or heavens, but I know nothing of these things. This however is quite clear to me that we shall all be provided with a suitable body whichever heaven we may go to. Here on this earth plane we are provided with a corresponding, earthly, body, in order that we can function in this world. If we go to celestial planes, then we shall have celestial bodies through which we can function on celestial planes, or in the highest heaven. But although our bodies will be different in texture, and rate of vibration they will still be like us in appearance. That is to say, we shall easily be recognizable, but glorified in appearance. I mention this because so many people, having read all kinds of conflicting theories about what happens to us after we are dead, are afraid that they will never see or meet their loved ones again. I am convinced that this is not so. Love can never die, and those we love can never die, and love will surely bring us together again. Also we shall surely recognize one another, we shall find our loved ones glorified, but they will still bear the same likeness. Now a word about death itself, and by death I mean the passing on of the victorious soul to higher realms, when it sloughs off the physical body. I am convinced that the act of dying is not a painful process, and that on no account should it be feared. It is no more to be dreaded than falling asleep. Actually, it is like going into another room or rather it's like stepping out from a gloomy room into a lovely, sunlit garden, where are beautiful flowers and the singing of birds. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, This day you shall be with me in paradise. Some scholars tell us that the word translated paradise is an Asiatic word meaning a garden. Jesus did not say that the penitent thief would be with him in purgatory, or that he would have to sleep in the grave for a few thousand years until the resurrection. No, what he promised was that he, the thief, would be with him that day in paradise, or a garden. Death therefore is not a thing to be feared, for it is merely a stepping out into a lovely garden. We should therefore try not to mourn and sorrow too much over the passing of our loved ones, but rather try to rejoice with them in their newly found liberty and freedom. I was brought up in the belief that after death we would summarily be sent to hell or to heaven, according to our doctrinal beliefs. If we believed in a certain doctrine we would at death be changed miraculously into perfect godlike beings, on the other hand, if we did not believe in this doctrine, then we should go straight to hell, in spite of the fact that we might have lived blameless lives. Of course I protested against this idea. I could not understand why a person who may have been far from Christ-like in his life here, should go to heaven just because he believed in a certain doctrine, while a man who may have been a much better character should have to go to hell and be tortured forever, just because he did not believe in that particular doctrine. When I raised my feeble protest I was simply ignored by my elders who declared in no uncertain voice that living a good life was no good at all, that it would not save us from the wrath of God but, on the other hand it did not matter how wicked we might be, if we believed in the doctrine, we should go straight to heaven. From what they said it seemed obvious to me that it was a disadvantage to lead a good life, in the spirit of Jesus, and an advantage to lead an indifferent one, if with it we believe in a certain doctrine about Christ. My elders declared that they were right, for they had learned it all out of some books. As I was young and had never read their dreadful books, I had to give in but I was far from convinced. Now I know that what happens to us in the next life depends upon what we are within, and upon our thought life. According to the teaching in which I was reared, Dives would have gone to heaven instead of to a place of torment if he had believed in this certain doctrine. But Jesus never taught anything so unmoral. Dives went to the place he was fitted for, by reason of what he really was, and according to the life he had lived. He had fared sumptuously every day, while others starved, he had looked after himself and paid no attention to the beggar at his gate. If what my parents and other teachers had tried to make me accept had been true, 
and if Dives had believed in this particular doctrine and had gone to heaven instead of a place of torment, where could the heavenly denizens have put him, and what could they have done with him? Such a character could never have been fitted into a heavenly community, neither could he have been able to tolerate the love atmosphere of heaven. Nothing hurts more than the high vibrations of divine love to one who is far from being attuned to them, for love then appears as divine wrath. But of course there is no divine wrath, but only divine love. God is divine love to all eternity. We must never forget this great fact, we must never allow ourselves to be deceived into thinking otherwise. When we are faced by devilish suggestions that God is a God of wrath, fury and anger, let us repeat to our soul this great truth, that God is divine love to all eternity. God is love and cannot be anything that is not love. But what is love to one who is attuned and filled with love, appears as wrath and anguish to the one who is not attuned, especially one who not only lacks love, but is filled with envy, strife, jealousy, hatred and resentment. Consequently we all go to an environment which is an outpicturing of what we are inwardly. The same law applies in this life. The man with a pothouse mind is happy, in his way, only in a pothouse, if he were put into a cathedral, or forced to attend a classical concert, he would be miserable and irritated and would know no rest until he got back to his pothouse. In the same way one who delights in cathedrals and classical music would be revolted if he had to spend his hours of leisure in a pothouse. Even in this life, we are generally to be found in an environment which corresponds to what we are within. The old idea was that when we die we suddenly become gods, that dying in some magical way transforms us into perfect godlike beings, and that the most selfish and bad-tempered of us would be just the same as the most saintly person who ever lived. The mere act of dying would make us all perfect provided, of course, that we believed in a certain doctrine. We know now of course, that this idea is all wrong. We know that we shall begin in the next life where we have left off here, and that our environment will be just right for us. I am convinced that there are various grades or planes, and that in one of them we shall find just the environment which will suit us perfectly. The essential thing is that we should cultivate heaven in our own heart now. We may have heaven in our heart, Although in this life our environment may not be altogether heavenly, but if we do this then in the next life we shall have the heaven in our heart expressed outwardly in the form of beauty, perfection, love, joy, peace and holy laughter, which always seems to me to be like the sound of silvery bells. At last we shall find complete satisfaction for all the deepest longings of our soul for perfect purity, selflessness, and expression of our love to God. Deep down within us is a great desire for goodness and a great love for God. This will find satisfaction in the next life. The important thing therefore is to cultivate an inner life of heavenly thoughts and ideas, and this of course is what Jesus taught. Change your minds, and consequently your thoughts, for the kingdom of heaven is nigh, or with you, think heavenly thoughts, cultivate an inner life of heavenly aspirations, Commune with your Father and my Father in the depths of your being. Yes, that is the great secret. What we think, that also do we become, if our inner thought life is attuned to heaven, then we have heaven within us and we become heavenly men and women. If we have heaven within us, then we shall find ourselves in a corresponding heaven when we pass on. Everything is beautifully arranged, so that no pure and noble thought is ever lost, no aspiration Godwards can ever be fruitless. Consequently, we should not grieve too much when our loved ones pass on. Neither should we be anxious about them if they did not accept the doctrines which certain people tell us are necessary. They will find themselves in just that environment which suits perfectly their present stage of unfoldment, and which will enable them to make progress towards higher and better things. God is infinite love and infinite wisdom, therefore everything has been arranged exactly right for each one of us, 
no matter at what stage we may be. God has a place for each one of us, and that place is perfect. God can never be anything other than love and, combined with infinite wisdom, this ensures perfect everything for each one of us. When our loved ones pass over, we should not mourn unduly, neither should we worry about them should they not have become spiritually awakened. Everything comes to pass at the right time for God's ways are perfect. We must also remember that the outward man that we see, the man of sin, or weakness, is not the real man. The real man is within, the real nature, the real self, is created in the likeness of Elohim and the time for his manifestation is not yet but will arrive in due course. Because God is infinite wisdom and infinite love, we need be anxious about nothing, we need be troubled about no one. What really troubles us is the wicked old theology which has held the world in bondage for so long. When we get rid of that and learn to love and adore God as He really is, we enter into peace, and all our fears and apprehensions come to an end. Instead of sorrowing and mourning, we should praise God and thank Him because He is infinite love and wisdom, and does all things well. We can commit our loved ones into God's hands, completely and unreservedly, for we know that infinite love and wisdom can only do the highest possible good for them, the most lovingly perfect, and wisest possible form of good the infinite can devise. We can thank the Lord too because He is leading them and us on to higher and better and more glorious things. We can rejoice with our loved ones in their newly found liberty and freedom, and joy and laughter, yes, laughter. Some people seem to think that laughter is wicked. So far from this being the case, I am sure that heaven is filled with laughter as indeed it is filled with worship and praise. On some occasions I have awakened from a deep sleep singing a happy devotional hymn with great feeling, while at other times I have wakened up laughing heartily in a very deep way, much deeper than any ordinary laughter. So deep indeed as to be quite beyond either description or explanation, and somewhat akin to the feeling which comes when deep breathing comes to us. Some readers will no doubt think the foregoing very elementary. So it is. It is written by an ordinary person for ordinary people. I know that mystics look upon the idea of going to heaven as rather childish, because they know that there is something far greater, I admit this. Truth is beyond all heavens, but still the heavens remain, in the same way that the earth remains in spite of our realization of higher things. Chapter 5, War Again From 1920 when my work started, until 1939 when the Second World War broke out, were years of comparative tranquility. There was of course the general strike in 1926, but I cannot remember that this affected us very much. There were also the struggle of changing or rewriting my books, and the strain of starting a magazine without much preparation or previous experience in such a venture. But generally speaking, life was fairly tranquil and the work grew and prospered. A sad feature of this period however was the number of unemployed who streamed past our place. Every day we had dozens of callers asking for work, or assistance on the road, and my work was frequently interrupted. Some of the men may have been impostors, but on the other hand many were genuine, and I do not know how I managed it, but I provided them with new boots of the army type, food, clothing, money, and also odd jobs of work. In those days there was of course a certain amount of freedom. I was able to buy crates of boots from a well-known London store, as well as well-knitted woolen socks of good quality. Also I could give a man a few hours or a day's work in the garden. Now, of course, such boots are not available, the tax gatherer takes most of the money I might otherwise spend on them, while I am not allowed to employ anyone without stamping his cards for a whole week. 
There are still in this year of 1951 almost as many men on the road as there were before the last war, in spite of the fact that most of the casual wards have been closed. Despite food rationing, however, we managed to provide them with simple meals and also money for the road, but as for clothes and boots, we cannot alas do much for them. I have been visited by murderers, ex-convicts and confidence tricksters, some of whom would have made splendid actors whilst others would have made very good salesmen. I was known all over England as the man who gave away boots and it was generally accepted that I was a millionaire. Not that I live like one, far from it, indeed, our house is small, while as for our clothes, we spend as little on them as possible. Make do and mend, is the rule in our household, yet in spite of this, I had the reputation of being a millionaire, a strange idea not only held by the men on the road fraternity, but also by some of the local inhabitants. One lady who came from Portsmouth told me that when she inquired from a man at work, on the road where I lived he said that he knew me, and that I was a millionaire chap who kept a lot of typewriters. On another occasion a man living about two miles away came to see me, and said that he had fallen out of work, and that he had been told that I would help him, as I was a millionaire. This mistaken idea was evidently widespread. There was also another strange idea, equally mistaken, held by quite a number of men on the road. This was that I was Max Pemberton, the well-known novelist and journalist. For years we had persistent callers, all asking to see Mr. Max Pemberton, some even brought manuscripts for his expert opinion. When they were told that Max Pemberton did not live here and never had done so, it was easy to see that they did not believe it, but that they looked upon it as a trick to get rid of them. I had so many callers and down-at-heel visitors that at times I found it difficult to deal with them all and, at the same time, carry on with my work. Directly I sat down to a meal, there would be a ring at the doorbell and away I would go to render help to someone whose need was greater than my own. When I got back to my meal, it would be cold. This did not trouble me, but it was disappointing to my wife who had spent hours in preparing it. As soon, too, as I settled down to my work, the bell would go again. Then I would leave my desk and minister to another, out of work, only to be met on my return by two or more unfortunates who wanted to see me. And so it would go on. Sometimes I felt rather harried and driven by it all, but I tried to be as patient as possible, remembering the one who trod the hard way before us and who bore so many stripes. Also it seemed to me, very often, that in ministering to these, men of the road, I was ministering to Jesus in disguise and after it was over I would feel glad in my heart. I thought of those words of his, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. This experience was a good opportunity for me to learn something about the lives of these flotsam and jetsam of life. I wanted to know why these men had come down in the world. Some were drunken, others vicious but most were merely weak, some were doctors, some lawyers, while others had at one time held similar positions. Mostly in these cases there was a history of giving way to drink or vicious habits. But there were plenty who were neither drunken nor vicious. And there were also the criminals, a few of whom made a beeline for my place as soon as they were discharged from prison. After a time I began to recognize the new suit with which each long-term prisoner is supplied on the day of his discharge. Other men's clothes were old and worn, whereas the newly discharged prisoner always had a new suit. I soon found that criminals were all alike, psychologically. They all had a grudge against life, they nursed resentments towards all in authority. They believed that everyone was engaged in a racket from the judge down to the humblest warder, even including the chaplain, that what these officials were doing was simply for what they could get out of it. Missions and the Salvation Army, too, were simply a big swindle, defrauding the public and oppressing the poor prisoners. 
It was easy to see that so long as they held these ideas, and nursed their resentments they would continue to find themselves in prison from time to time. But how to cure them was the problem, for they were set in their ideas and habits of thought. It seemed that nothing could ever change them. To attempt psychological treatment seemed to me to be hopeless and even foolish, what was needed was a complete change of heart and mind such as came to John Bunyan. But this is the work of the spirit and not of man, although man may be used as a channel as also may be the printed word. Many of the men would no doubt have worked if someone had arranged for them to do a certain number of hours, labor each day, and then to draw their wages at the end of the week. But as far as one could judge they had no more idea of how to find new work, or how to create new work through their own resources, than a pig has of flying. They were mere, dumb-driven cattle, victims of circumstances. How to help them was indeed a problem. A large proportion of these poor failures had sunk down to the lowest stratum, of life simply through expecting other people to help them, and through self-pity. They complained that they had never had anyone to help them. One man told me that his mother had died, and so he had no home, never a thought apparently of his ever making one for her. Others were down at the bottom through not facing up to life's difficulties. They tried to dodge their responsibilities, always following the path of least resistance. It looked the easy way, but always it turned out to be the hard way. All criminals apparently belong to this class. They see a thing and take it, because to do so seems to be an easy way out, they run a swindle because it promises them a rich reward without the grind of working. There were however some good workers, and I admired them very much. I told them that their trouble was only temporary, for it was obvious that because of their energy, and willingness to serve they would find a regular job sooner or later. As my readers will know, if we grapple with life's difficulties, and choose the difficult way instead of the path of least resistance, life yields up to us her richest treasures. It does not matter how difficult or impossible our path may appear to be, there is always a way through if we go forward in faith. These experiences of meeting all sorts and conditions of men were really helpful to me, as they gave me a valuable opportunity of studying at first hand the problem of failure. I could see myself in these failures, I could say. There, but for the grace of God, goes H, T, H. However, as I have already said, life on the whole was uneventful and peaceful. But of course I had struggles of a spiritual kind, and also my share of sorrows and disappointments, as all people have, but outwardly life was fairly serene. Then came September 1939, and with it yet another war. The actual outbreak of hostilities was preceded by an unnatural peace. As a rule one in a position such as mine is conscious, in a special way and to an unusual degree, of the existence of powers which battle against the soul and all that is of the light. But just before the outbreak of war these forces seemed to have been withdrawn, so that there was a great calm. This proved to be the calm before the storm. Since that experience I have always been suspicious, of those occasions when all the warring forces, of evil disappear and there is a great and unnatural peace. This is a sign that great trouble is brewing. It is natural for the soul to be in conflict, and for the warfare of the soul to continue almost without cessation, for it is only in this way that we can make progress in our spiritual unfoldment. Therefore should all the warring elements suddenly be withdrawn, this is unnatural and should be looked upon with suspicion. Also it should make us prepare to meet the blow which is to fall, by waiting upon God and finding his inward peace, which is of a different quality from the spurious peace of the unnatural calm before the storm. The difference is like that between real period furniture and a cheap and shiny imitation. The blow fell and caught me unawares, 
as I had been deceived by the unnatural calm and had therefore not made the preparation that I ought to have made. Preparation by prayer, I mean. I do not mean that I was so conceited and foolish, as to think that my prayers could prevent the war from happening which was a karmic effect of years of wrong thinking on the part of millions of people. No, all that I could have done would have been to prepare myself for the shock of hostilities, and to have put on the whole armor of God more completely. Consequently I was hit rather hard, because the outbreak of armed conflict, in the material world was accompanied by an ever fiercer war in the invisible world, all the forces of hell seemed to be belched up at that time. These hellish agencies seemed to make me their special target, but I was only one of many, yet at the time it seemed to me that I received their special attention. This was only natural, for the object of the dark forces is to destroy the children of the light. Although all are attacked, those who are leaders and teachers are their special target, for if they can but be destroyed then the movement which they represent will collapse like a pack of cards. When hostilities broke out a cloud of spiritual darkness descended upon me, and I seemed to be gripped by overwhelming forces of evil. This was not merely depression from which most people suffer when overwhelmed by trouble and fear of impending disaster, it was something of a far different quality. It was a darkness of soul, as though God had been completely wiped out of the universe, as though all goodness, light, truth and love had been destroyed and that nothing remained but eternal ruin and despair for the soul of man. It was impossible to find God or to realize His presence, all my attempts at prayer were fruitless. There were nothing but darkness and emptiness. God had apparently ceased to exist that is, the God whom I had known. Of course God was still operating in His universe as usual, for the heavenly bodies still pursued their respective courses just as serenely as before. Indeed, after a time, this very fact was a source of comfort to me. To watch the various operations of nature taking place as usual, in spite of the awful upset on this planet made by man himself, became in time a source of satisfaction to me. But the God I had known, the God of intimate intercourse and companionship, had apparently disappeared. I could no longer retire into the inner chamber of my soul and find God there as infinite joy, peace and bliss indescribable. There were nothing but darkness and the seeming despair, and lamentations of countless millions of apparently lost souls. As I say, this was no mere attack of depression, such as one can overcome by an effort of will, compelling oneself to cheer up. I found myself in a new experience. I was indeed under a cloud, and I seemed to be in the grip of all the powers of darkness from which there seemed no way of escape. One Saturday afternoon found me busily engaged in making blackout shutters. In actual fact the frames had been made by the local carpenter to fit every window in the house, and what I was doing was covering them with suitable opaque material. While I was in the middle of this task John Moraton arrived. Now John Moraton is no ordinary man. Without my telling him anything he had divined intuitively that something was amiss, so he had come down from London to see what he could do to help. There was no need for me to tell him that I was under a cloud, for he could see it. But let me digress for a moment. Some years ago I read a little book written by a vicar, in which he related an experience which came to him during a church service. The curate was taking part and while he was reading the lesson the vicar, who was at times clairvoyant, saw a powerful dark angel approach the young man and envelop him. After the service the vicar spoke to the curate on the matter, who told him that at the moment when the dark angel was seen to envelop him, he felt a great fear come upon him, and that it still remained with him. Now in my present experience I could understand what had happened to the young curate, for I seemed to be in much the same fix. I was the curate, John Moraton was the vicar. He did not say anything about a dark angel, but he said that he was conscious of an evil presence. 
I recalled an incident which had occurred some years previously, when a man was brought to me by his wife. What his complaint, a form of paralysis, was called I do not know, but none of the doctors and specialists who had been consulted could do anything for him. He told me that it started when, as a curate, he was conducting a church service and he was suddenly seized by a great fear. After the experience he lost control of his thumbs which became weak, and which twitched and could not be controlled. Then the nervous disease spread over the rest of his body. When I examined him I found that he was perspiring like a man doing hard work, with every muscle flexed, and as hard and rigid as though he were lifting a hundred pound barbell. Unfortunately, much to my sorrow, I could do nothing for him, but I am sure now that the poor man was suffering from a form of psychic invasion, even as had happened to the other curate. I also believe that I was attacked in the same way, and that it was due to the grace of God and John Moriton that I was set free. It will be observed that in all three cases, we were trying to help humanity, and so perhaps it was partly because of this that we became targets for those dark forces which seek to destroy the children of the light. But, of course, in each individual case there must have been some weak spot or chink in our armor which allowed the enemy entrance. I think that some people are liable to become so busy trying to help others that they neglect their own defenses. Our first duty, so I think now, should be to guard ourselves by putting on the whole armor of God, and through waiting upon him close the chinks which might leave a loophole for the enemy. Both John Moriton and I wrestled with the dark presence, but without any noticeable effect. So he went back to London and I was left to struggle on alone. He had his work and I had mine, but at intervals we both tried to realize ultimate truth. The nights of course were the worst, I spent hours wrestling with those powers which seek not only to destroy the body but also the soul. I tried all the methods which I knew including the famous affirmation. God is the only power and presence, and God is love which, repeated very earnestly for hours at a stretch, kept the foe at bay, but that was about all. I persevered. The days and weeks went by with apparently little or no improvement, but all the time the steady work which we both, John Moriton and I, did in affirming truth, was gradually undermining the power which gripped me. At last I began to feel that the cloud was lifting and the power lessening. Finally, I entered into the light again, and found God's inward peace, much to my joy and relief. And so the danger was past, but it had indeed been a trying and searching experience. I do not think that the experience was unnecessary, certainly I am richer and, I hope, wiser for having passed through it. I am sure that no experience would come to us if it were not necessary, for if it did it would be quite meaningless. There is a purpose in everything and in every happening which comes to us, which is that we are brought into our final happiness and bliss in God, the one central harmony. I have to admit, however, that painful experiences may come to us because, a failure on our part to maintain our own integrity. But the experience which we attract to ourselves is not a punishment from God, it is the natural result of our failure to keep close to our center. It is remedial and not punitive. We are not punished for our sins, but we reap as we sow, it is a case of action and reaction, as we sow, so do we reap. The experience which comes to us is the best possible thing, as it is devised by infinite wisdom, and infinite love exactly to suit our condition and meet perfectly our need and correct our weakness, whatever that may be. This was by no means the last of the attacks made upon me by the dark forces. Indeed, every conceivable effort has been made by would-be possessing spirits to gain an entrance, and I have had to fight, as it were, for my very life and soul. Presences have visited me which were so evil that they made every hair of my head literally to stand on end. I had previously read of people's hair standing on end, 
but had thought that such a thing was impossible, and that it was merely an exaggerated figure of speech. But I was to experience it myself and to know that it was something far worse than any figure of speech. However, each time I was brought victoriously through. I found that there was one infallible method of dealing with these evil powers, and that was to make use of the name of Jesus. This name is all-powerful on all planes, and evil powers and entities simply cannot stand up to it. The name Jesus is all-powerful over evil powers because he overcame them, being himself tempted at all points even as we. During the time of his ministry he was attacked again and again by infernal powers, and those who would follow him may be attacked in the same way. But those of us who do try to follow him, possess an infallible talisman in the name which is above every name Jesus. Again and again, calling on this name has brought speedy deliverance to me when all seemed lost. The all-powerful name is Jesus, not Christ, although the two may be used together of course. The word Christ merely means the Anointed One, or Meshes, whereas according to Weymouth Jesus means Joshua, or Yehoshua, meaning Jehovah the Savior. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. This means saved from sinning which again means that we are delivered from sin and its dominion over us, and from all the evil powers to which sin connects us. Every sin and every wrong thought connect us by invisible cords to hellish and infernal powers and forces. By calling on the name of Jesus, sinful thoughts and also our love of them, are destroyed in us and the dominion of their corresponding infernal powers and potencies is broken. Having been delivered from the terrifying experience with the dark forces, the first decision that I made was that I must continue my work as usual. It seemed to me that what I had to teach would be needed very much during the period of hostilities, so I made up my mind to do my best to help our people through the difficult times through which they were passing. I therefore brought out my book Life Without Strain, and sent it to our friends as expeditiously as possible. The fact that it was given away, instead of being sold, made some people very suspicious. They thought that there must be a, catch, in it, especially as it was attractively bound in blue cloth with gold foil lettering and a dust jacket without any advertisement on it. I had 10,000 copies printed and bound. Since the above was written, another edition of 10,000 copies has been prepared. So many applications were received from people who wished to buy this book that I had inserted a printed notice inside each copy stating that a copy would be sent free to any applicant, and that on no account should any money be sent for it. This made some people even more suspicious, one man writing in great perplexity, how are you able to give away books such as this while other people charge top prices? The answer was a simple one given to us by Jesus who, according to Paul, said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Our supporters had been giving, giving, giving to this work over the years, entirely on their own initiative. I thought that it was time that I gave them something. One feels happier after giving, rather than receiving, a gift which proves the truth of what Jesus said. As to how I could afford to issue the book free, or find the money with which to pay the printer and binder, which was probably what our inquirer meant, I must confess that I did not give it a thought. I did not even know how much the project was going to cost, I simply gave the order, leaving the price to the printer to settle. When the bin came in, we had no difficulty in paying it at once. Now I do not recommend others to follow this happy-go-lucky way of dealing with financial matters. The important thing is to be divinely led, if we are doing the right thing, supply comes as it were of its own accord, whereas if we are not doing the right thing, the financial side may be something of a nightmare. The essential thing is that we should do everything according to the mind and will of God, when we know this to be the case, we can go forward with confidence, knowing that supply will follow just as surely as day follows night. 
This is so because if we make sure that what we propose doing is according to the will of God, we obey the injunction to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, consequently all needful things are added, the right activity attracting its corresponding supply, according to whatever the need may be. The right activity and its corresponding supply together form one complete whole, and are part of the divine order. If all our outer activities were according to the interior order, in correspondence with the activities of the real world in which the true self lives and moves and has its being, then our life here would be beautiful and harmonious beyond description. But alas, our outward activities and our thinking seldom even approximate to the divine pattern, and so our terrestrial lives shew forth much disorder, instead of heaven's harmony and peace. Outwardly our lives were fairly peaceful during the war. We were only attacked from the air once, when we had two bombs in our garden and two over the hedge in the next field. These caused a certain amount of material damage, but no one was hurt nor even scratched. Not one beehive was knocked over, while our hens continued to lay as usual. The villagers also were wonderfully preserved. One night two mines were dropped, causing considerable damage to 160 houses, but not a single person was injured. So we had much to be thankful for. Nevertheless, all this was rather trying to two elderly people. Also my wife and I got very little sleep most nights, as we had to be our own fire watchers and fire fighters. In all this, of course, our experiences were much the same as those of thousands of others, and we would not have had it otherwise. During the whole time we had not the slightest feeling of resentment, neither did we suffer from self-pity. We simply took things as they came, and kept on praising and thanking God for all His goodness and mercy. We felt sorry for those who tried to destroy us, and prayed for them and their loved ones that they might be divinely blessed in every possible way. I think that this was possible because for so long we had made a practice of praying for our enemies that they might be blessed in every possible way and be the recipients of all manner of divine good. If our home had been destroyed and our little grandson killed it would have been harder to do so, yet we should still have persevered in thanking and blessing God, and in praying for those who had caused the destruction. Father forgive them for they know not what they do, is the prayer which comes naturally to one when badly attacked by those who regard themselves as our enemies. They are the victims of hellish forces working through them, and do not really know what they are doing. After being bombed, I spent the rest of the night in blessing, thanking and praising God. I simply felt that this was what I wanted to do, I did not want to be protected or saved from any pain or suffering, or be favored more than other people. I felt that I just wanted to bless and praise God and express my love and gratitude. At first when bombing began, I think that I resisted mentally and wanted to be protected. I am sorry to have to confess it, but I think that I wanted to be protected and also my loved ones, and also my work, and that I was not so concerned about other people, at any rate, at that time. It is a dreadful confession to have to make, for it reveals an incredible selfishness, but I think that we should try to be as truthful as possible in all matters. It was after we were bombed, when things became even more difficult and trying, that I realized that I no longer wanted to be protected but that I just wanted God, no matter what might happen. This, I felt, was a great advance. Previously I had been putting my own safety and that of my loved ones first, and also my work which is my very life. I had been putting these things first, and God second. This was all wrong, for Jesus said that we should seek first the kingdom of God, after which whatever we might need would be added. Immediately I gave up wanting to be protected and I knew that all I wanted was God, and that it did not matter what might happen so long as I had God, it was then that I entered into a new and more intimate relationship with Him. It was an inner union with God, so deep and intimate that I cannot describe it, but it brought great satisfaction to my soul. 
Then I thanked God for the experiences which had brought this wonderful thing about, for it did not seem possible that I should ever have arrived at this state of inner union without them. That is how it appears in my case, but of course with others it may be different. Some mystics speak of the abyss and falling into it which may have the same effect. The object of our incarnation here is simply that we should find God and enter into eternal union with Him. The I, the, me, and the, mine, have to be surrendered, so that God can be all in all. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, said Jesus, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. John 12, 24. He that findeth, or clings to, his, personal or self, life shall lose it, and he that lusseth, or gives up, his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 10, 39. The war dragged on, and we got used to ordinary bombing. Then came the flying bombs which were much more fearsome, for they seemed to emit a spirit of evil. After that the rockets began to fall, on London and Kent mostly, so they did not trouble us. Then came the most terrible thing of all, the invention of the atom bomb. When we learned over the radio that the USA had dropped an atom bomb on Japan we felt overcome with horror. In addition, we knew that this was only the beginning of a new reign of terror. We remembered the words of Jesus, for with the same measure that ye meet with all it shall be measured to you again. After that came the day of rejoicing, that is, for those who could rejoice. We regarded such rejoicing with horror. If only, instead of an atom bomb, we could have dropped a bundle of compressed love on Hiroshima. The End You have heard my search for truth, volume 2nd by Henry Thomas Hamblin, a creation of rich and spiritual.